All right, Joshua chapter number five. Let's jump right in here, verse number one. Now, of course, in chapters 3 and 4, we read uh, about the crossing of the Jordan River and, and the great miracle that happened as a result. And we, you know, I had spent quite a bit of time talking about how God uses these great events and He wants His glory to be made known. And these, these, these huge miracles, like when He led the people out of Egypt at the crossing of the Red Sea, how all the nations have heard about that. And now with the crossing of Jordan, we're going to see in verse number 1 here at chapter 5, how quickly the news spread. I mean, I mean, this has just happened. This event just happened. It's not, it's not like there's been a whole month has passed or even a whole week has passed. It's only been a few days in the context here of this chapter. It's been like a day or two. Um, now, now we get information of everything that happened, but verse number one says, And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. Obviously, this is planned by God, and He knows the reaction it's going to be. I mean, you think about a, a group of people coming into the land, and they know that God has promised them this land. This isn't something that's brand new to them. This is something that's been known at the very least since Moses led the people out of Egypt. I mean, they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So the word about them coming out of Egypt and who the Lord is has had plenty of time to get around to all the, the, the nations surrounding and that they were to be bringing them into the land of Canaan. So the Canaanites were aware that this was going to happen. Now, many of them probably scoffed. Many of them probably thought, oh, yeah, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, their God brought them out of Egypt and brought, left them to die in the wilderness and, and probably came up with all of their own excuses and everything else. Not to be worried, not to be concerned, and just scoffed at it as the heathen always does with the Lord. Right? It's just mocking God. Probably, you know, uh, we don't have all of that evidence here, but we know that the way that the, how wicked the land was. We know that from Scripture. So they didn't have a fear of the Lord anyway, so it would stand to reason that I'm sure they were just mocking God. But now we see when the time actually comes, when God's ready now to bring them into the promised land, and He cuts off the Jordan River, he's like, and, and the people hear about this, their heart melts. I mean, they're sunk. They're already destroyed within them. Now it's just a matter of time before the children of Israel get there. And events like this, the great working of God has such an impact on people. And this is one of the reasons why God performs these miracles, especially specifically, so that the heathen can see and hear and fear. And it makes it all the much easier now for the children of Israel to go. One, it should boost their confidence, as we talked about in previous weeks, as well as now destroying the spirit of their enemies, making the battles much more easy to be won. Because, what, you know, a, a lot of times fights and things like that are, are a big mind game. And when you have the desire to fight and to win and you know and you're, you have confidence, you're going to do way better than if you go into a battle just already defeated, already thinking you lost. You, you have that type of mindset, you're going to lose. And this is the mindset now that God has put into these people. Because, why? Because they've seen the miracle now. They, they've heard about it. It's just like, okay, God, you know, there is really something with them. You know, they do have some type of power. Whether they, want, whether they want to ascribe that power to the Lord or not doesn't matter because they can see that, that they have uh, God with them, however they want to find that. And they're already kind of smitten in their heart. But let's keep reading here. There's a, there's a couple of points that I really want to spend a lot of time on that are brought up in this passage. Two main points, and that has to do with circumcision and the manna. Because those are the two kind of main things that I see are going on here other than this. So verse number one, of course, we see the people are already uh, defeated in their minds. But then we kind of shift gears. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee excuse me, sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. There's a lot of symbolic meaning to this with them kind of coming out, coming into the, the promised land and kind of getting a new start and a fresh start. Now, uh, we're going to see later that the reproach of Egypt basically is finally removed from them. It's been 40 years 
since they actually left Egypt, but it's not until now. It's not until pretty much it's like the very beginning of them entering the promised land. They're shedding that foreskin and they're moving into that promised land and, and God is fulfilling his promises to them that, um, that, that kind of ends that reproach of Egypt that's been upon them this whole time. Let's keep reading at verse number 3. It says, And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised. But all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land which the Lord swear unto their fathers that he would give us. A land that floweth with milk and honey and their children whom he raised up in their stead them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. So basically what this is saying is that <clears throat> when the children of Israel were originally brought forth out of Egypt, the men were circumcised. They had already been keeping that covenant that God had made with Abraham. Now, stay, put a finger here. Of course, we're coming back to Joshua 5. Turn to Genesis 17. We're going to see where circumcision starts with, with Abraham. But what's happening here in this story is that it's saying that the children of Israel, the men of Israel, they had, been, they had been keeping that covenant. So the men that came out of Egypt, they were all circumcised. But when God led them out of Egypt and they sinned in the wilderness and they turned their backs and they, and, you know, and they, and they didn't want to go into the promised land and they got fearful and they didn't trust in the Lord, God said, nope, all the people basically of this generation now... They're forced to wander in the wilderness until they die. So that's why they spent 40 years in the wilderness, because all those men of war, God was just waiting for them all to die off, that whole generation. So that generation, yes, those men were circumcised, but their children, whom they had brought up in the wilderness, those that were being born over, over the span of 40 years, you know, kids are being born out in the wilderness, they did not circumcise those children. And the reason why it says, well, they were by the way. They, did, they, you know, they didn't just have a certain dwelling place. They were traveling around a lot. So as they're moving camp, they don't know how long they're going to stay in any one place. They're moving around. They're not circumcising their children in the wilderness. Now, I don't think that was right. I think they, they should have been keeping God's laws, even in the wilderness. I mean, they're having children in the wilderness. That's not very convenient. To, to be on the move and having babies, I would think that that's probably, I mean, I know that that's a harder thing to do than it is to actually perform a circumcision at eight days old. But they weren't doing it. They didn't have, you know, they didn't have everything set up or whatever. So they weren't keeping that circumcision. So that's why now when they, when the, the older generation has passed, now you've got a new generation of men that have not been circumcised that God's saying, wait, before we go any further, you're, you're getting ready to inherit this land. You're getting ready to conquer this land. We need to make sure that everybody's circumcised. And then, and then we go forward with this. Now, we're going to look a little bit into this because I want to dig into this kind of doctrine of circumcision and what it means and why we don't need to adhere to this in the New Testament. And I'm not going to do an extreme thorough job of this because there's other things in this chapter I want to get to, but it is an important part of this chapter with the children of Israel being circumcised again, as it were, um, getting ready to take over the promised land. But turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 17. I think you should already be there. And we're going to go through this chapter because this is where God makes His promise to Abraham. And this is where circumcision is instituted. It's actually prior to the laws that God gives to Moses. Now, of course, circumcision is included in the law given to Moses, but it actually originates with Abraham here. And this is actually, if you, you, know, if you think back to the announcements, we're talking about the March in Zion conference. For those of you that haven't seen that documentary, don't know what it's all about, uh, it ties in somewhat with circumcision even, because this is something that... Uh, a passage that people will turn to to try to prove that the, the physical nation of Israel that exists today 
deserves the land that God promised to Abraham. And they'll actually look at verse, the chapter like Genesis 17 in order to prove that because they'll say, look, this is an everlasting covenant. They'll say this is something that's supposed to be forever, that the, the physical seed of Abraham, that the Jews just are entitled to that land for eternity. And what I'm going to do in showing you circumcision and what that means, I'm going to also show why that's not true and why that's false. And we have a lot of light shed on the Old Testament when we look at New Testament passages. But let's start in the Old Testament here with Genesis 17 at the beginning of circumcision with Abraham. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, before we even get any farther, I just want to point out, he's, he's the promise and the, the blessing that God is giving to Abram. He's saying, you're going to be a father of many nations. He didn't say you're going to be a father of one nation. So right off the bat, the blessing that's coming upon Abraham is saying, you know, you're going to be a father of many nations. And those many nations are going to be blessed. Not just one nation that's going to come forth of thy loins. It's many nations are going to be blessed. Let's keep reading, though. Just keep that in mind because that is very critical, actually, to understanding everything that this is talking about. The Bible says in verse number 5, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Even his name is changed in accordance with the fact that he's going to be a father of many nations. God says, this is, this is so defining for you that I'm changing your name so that it means you're a father of many nations. Abraham, as opposed to Abram. Verse number six, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of these, of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Verse number eight, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So people will turn to that and say, see, it's an everlasting possession, right? It's a promise. God made it. It says forever that this is going to be their possession. And um, so obviously this is just talking to Abraham and to every, and, and see what, where they get this wrong is they want to say, well, this, this promise was made to Abraham and his, his descendants, and basically, they want to apply it just to, to Israel, right? To the modern day nation of Israel. But if you're going to truly just say, well, this is to, to his seed, meaning his descendants, wouldn't that then apply to all of his descendants? I mean, if that's the way we're just going to read this passage. You, you know, what, what, otherwise, what is it that would make you separate and say, well, it's only this group of people. Because Abraham had many children, too. And we'll, we'll get into that in just a minute. Just, just keep these thoughts in mind. We're going to keep reading here. Now, the other thing I want to note here is we're going to see this in verse number 9, is that this promise is also conditional that he made on keeping this covenant of circumcision. So in verse number 8, it says that I'm going to give unto thee into thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. Verse number 9 says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Now, if it was all just physically speaking on the circumcision being required for them to have this everlasting covenant, they broke that covenant when they were in the wilderness. 
Because they weren't, I mean, yeah, they ended up getting circumcised later, but they weren't circumcised on the eighth day as God commanded them because none of those children were circumcised coming out. So if it's a covenant, does God have to keep a covenant if, if one end breaks that covenant? No, they're not obligated to do that. But the circumcision they're talking about, this is, this is all symbolic. Circumcision, and we'll get into this again a little bit more deep, but the circumcision obviously is something that physically was required and it was part of the law and it's something that God commanded them to do. But as with pretty much every commandment that God gives them, especially these ceremonial type of commandments, there's always a deeper meaning to that. There's always more that it's about than just some physical act. So just a physical act of performing a circumcision, yeah, God wanted them to do that, but he wanted them to do that for a reason because it symbolizes something else. It symbolizes their separation from the heathen. It symbolizes them being a different people. They're physically altering themselves to be different. It also is representative of what's supposed to be on the inside, which is the circumcision of their heart. The removing of the stony flesh over their heart and opening them up unto the Lord. That is ultimately what is the most important thing and what it's all about. And it's being a child of God because their heart has been circumcised and they've opened up their heart to the Lord. But we're gonna, and we're going to see, you know, this isn't just something I made up. And a lot of people who are already agreeing with me probably have read their Bible and have seen the verses that we're going to turn to. We're going to see some of this. But I'm going to prove it to you tonight. And we're going to see just straight out of Scripture that that has always been what is the most important thing and what God is really look at, looking at and what He's concerned the most with. Just as He said, He's not that concerned with the, you know, with the, the sacrifices. Now, He gave rules and in, in, in the way everything needs to be done in the Levitical priesthood on offering up different sacrifices for different things. And He expected them to follow everything to a T, how he wanted that to be done. But at the end of the day, what he's most concerned about is their heart in getting right with God more than just the physical sacrifices and their obedience to his word and respect unto God way more than just any offering and sacrifice that you can give to the Lord. It's always been about the heart. It's always been about his people in heart, not in flesh. That's what God cares about the most. And people get so hung up on, on some of these passages and they try to read into them too much or maybe not enough into getting the spirit of the law and only looking at maybe the letter and only looking at the physical, just like they did in Jesus' day when they were trying to condemn the apostles for eating on the Sabbath. When they're picking corn as they're doing God's work, they're preaching the gospel, right? And, and they're trying to condemn them. And Jesus is saying, look, you don't know the spirit of the law. You don't understand why the Sabbath was even given to you. Like you, you've got it so focused down into saying that you can't do anything. You practically can't even breathe without breaking the Sabbath. You, know, you don't even understand why it was given to you to begin with. And if you understand the meaning behind it, you'd understand that they're not breaking the Sabbath. That are not guilty of breaking the Sabbath. Just like, you know, if you, if you help an ox out of the ditch that's like going to die or broke its leg or whatever on the Sabbath day, you're not breaking the Sabbath in doing good and in healing and helping. You don't understand the spirit of the law. They're just so focused in on the letter, they totally ignore the meaning and the purpose of what the law is there for. And it's the same thing with circumcision. And even to this day, you know, I, at, at Jesus' day, there was people who actually thought that circumcision still had to be followed. And some people thought even to be saved. Now, I don't think there's people that believe that necessarily today, but there's still a lot of Christians that will perform circumcisions and think that it's something that they should do. But let's, let's keep reading here in Genesis 17. I want to get too far ahead of myself because there's a lot of different issues that go along with this and I want to try to clear up as much as possible in a short period of time. So try to follow with me here. Verse number um, 11 in Genesis 17. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. 
and the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now, the people that want to focus on this everlasting covenant of God giving the, the physical land of Canaan to his descendants, and they want to focus on it being an everlasting covenant. Right? Because that's what they want to focus This is forever. They always are entitled to this land. Then tell me this, because in the same context, in the same passage, he's saying, you must needs be circumcised for an everlasting covenant. And if it has to last forever, then keep your finger in Genesis 17 and tell me, why is it that in the book of Romans, or excuse me, in the book of 1 Corinthians, verse, or chapter number 7, verse number 18, the Bible says, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. If it was that important, why does the Bible say in the New Testament that, hey, if you're not circumcised, don't get circumcised? If you're circumcised, just stay circumcised. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it, but just stay circumcised, right? And he said, it doesn't matter, right? Whatever calling you're calling, just, that's fine. It's nothing. That's not what it's all about. But if it was so important for this everlasting covenant then why would that even be in the Bible in the New Testament? Why would he say that? Because it's not what it's all about. The people will tell you, oh no, well the Jews still need to keep the, the, the circumcision. Really? So the Jews don't need to adhere to New Testament teachings? They don't need to listen to the Word of God? Because I'll tell you what, you... Just because the Apostle Paul was the one who physically wrote down a lot of the New Testament doesn't mean that the Apostle Paul, it's his own ideas and he's the author of the New Testament and that there's a certain group of people, they don't have to listen to him, who, by the way, he physically was a Jew himself. No, no, but they don't have to listen. Yes, they do. It's the Word of God. It applies to them as much as it applies to anybody else. And if the New Testament says avoid genealogies, if the New Testament says that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, then that applies to everybody. And this is coming from a Jew himself. Obviously, something's mixed up then here in Genesis 17 for people to say, oh no, it's an everlasting covenant that they deserve this land forever then that means that circumcision is everlasting too and you have to be circumcised physically forever. Let's keep reading. Genesis 17. Verse number 15. The Bible reads, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Now, up to this point, when God changes Abraham's name, Abraham doesn't have that much of a problem with this, because as a man, you know, he's 99 years old, but he can still see how he could be a father of many nations as a man being able to, to, to procreate, be able to have children, even as a man being, even though he's really old, it's probably not as powerful of a promise to him now as Sarah is because Sarah's 90 years old. And he hears, wait a minute, you're telling me that my wife is also going to receive this blessing of being a mother of many nations and kings are going to, you know, like what in the world? And, and, and he actually, it amuses him. He laughs. Look at verse number 17. It says, Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? 
And shall Sarah, that is 90 years old, bear? He's saying, I'm 100 and my wife's 90. Like, <laughs> what do you mean? We're going to be uh, you know, parents to, the, to this multitude of nations. But this, this is getting to what it's all about. And it's the promise of God. It's not about the, the physical thing. Obviously, you know, this is a miracle that God is performing for a woman who's way past the age of, of being, uh, her body being able to produce children for that to even happen. And the whole point, and we see this in the New Testament, we're not going to get into all the passages about this, but about uh, Isaac being the, son, the child of promise. And that that's what it's all about, is that we're children of that promise, same promise when we believe God. But um, let's keep reading here because it, this, is all, this is all really good stuff. Look at verse number 18. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. So it's almost like, you know, Abraham saying, you know, <laughs> that's great, God, but you know, I'm 100, she's 90. How about we just do everything through Ishmael? You know, I mean, like, he's already born, he's here, you can bless him. And, uh, and God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Now, I think that's great. Yeah, if you have children, how difficult it could be sometimes naming a child. Wouldn't it be great for God to just be like, okay, you're going to call his name? Like, great. Awesome. I love that name. Thanks, God. <laughs> but he says, nope, you're going to have a son, and his name's going to be Isaac. That's the end of the story. And, and he's saying, you know, obviously God's going to bless Ishmael as well, but he's, he's, he's letting Abraham know very firmly, now look, you are going to have a son. I'm not just kidding here. I'm not just saying this. You know, just because your wife and you are old doesn't mean that you can't have a child when I said you're going to have a child. And, and God is just firming this up. He says, thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. And you know what? I'll bless Ishmael also, but my covenant, my promise, this everlasting promise I'm making is going to be with Isaac and with his seed. Now, the reference to this seed we're going to see in Galatians chapter 3. Turn if you would to Galatians chapter 3. Because all throughout that chapter, we saw the, the promise made to Abraham and to his seed after him. Promise is made to Abraham, it's made to, your, to you and to your seed. And you're going to inherit this land, and this land is an everlasting possession, and it's for you and for your seed. And, he, and then God says, when Sarah's going to have a son, you're going to call his name Isaac, and he is going to be recipient of this promise as well, you know, it's to you, to Isaac, and then to his seed after him. And if that's all the information we had in the Bible, it, it's very easy to see where you might think that this is referring to just all of the descendants, you know, just all the physical generations that just continue to happen and come of his seed would, would, would receive that land. But we have clarity provided, a light shine on this passage in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3. And honestly, I, th I still think you can get it without this, but this just makes it crystal clear beyond a shadow of a doubt. In Galatians chapter 3, look at verse number 6. We're going to start reading there. The Bible says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So first of all, when we're talking about Abraham's seed or his children, his descendants, he says it's those that are of faith. Anyone of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Verse number 8, in the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Well, where does that come from? Genesis 17 that we just read. All the nations of the earth. He's going to be a father of many nations. All the nations are going to be blessed. Verse number 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not 
in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, that law applies to everybody equally. If you don't keep all of the things in the law, you're cursed. Now, do the modern day Jews keep all of the law of God? Does anybody keep all of the law of God? So nobody can be saved by the law. It's a curse. It's a curse for everyone. That's why salvation is not through the law. That's why the works of the law, no flesh can be saved. Now jump down to verse number 16 here in Galatians 3, which is why we need a Savior, which is why we need Christ, why we need Jesus Christ. But um, verse number 16 in Galatians 3, the Bible says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So when God is making promises to Abraham and to his seed, the Apostle Paul is saying, you know what? That's not just, this isn't talking about everybody. He says it's to thy seed as of one, not seeds as of many. He says this isn't plural. This isn't, he's, not, he's not giving promises to everybody. This eternal promise isn't just for everybody, just no matter what, because they're physically descended from Abraham. It says this specific blessing and promise was given to Abraham. It was given to him by promise. And he said, not to seed of many, but as to one and to thy seed, which is Christ. The reason why it's everlasting, the reason why it's going to last forever is because he's given it to him and to his seed, which is Jesus Christ. And the reason why anybody gets to partake of that blessing or of that inheritance and be a part of that land is because they're able to get that through Christ. Because the promise was made to Abraham and to Jesus. And that's why Abraham's also kind of known as the father of faith. Because he believed God. And if we believe God the way that he believed God then we can also join in that inheritance and that actually is what makes us become children of Abraham. Is there something going on behind me that I don't know about here? <laughs> we have some extra props going on and... All right. It's not just me, right? I don't have anything like... I didn't clean up after dinner or something. All right. Let's look down at our Bibles here. Verse number... 17. Galatians 3, 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So basically what he's saying is that this promise was given to Abraham way before the law. Hundreds of years before God gave the law to Moses. And he's saying, you know, it, the promise is of none effect if now you can attain to that promise of inheritance by just obeying God's commandments, by just obeying the law. He's saying that would just nullify that promise. If you could just somehow obey the law enough to get it. He says, but that's not the way God gave it. God gave it to Abraham by promise. He's saying, so why is there even a law? The law was added because of transgressions. Because, you, because the people are wicked, because the people are doing things they're not supposed to be doing. So God said, this is what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And that's why it was added. But it was never meant to be a way to receive an inheritance and to become one of God's children. It was not ever meant to be through the law. That has always been by promise. That has always been through grace. It's always been a gift given to man. Now jump down, if you would, to verse number 26. The Bible says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And look at verse number 28 again. Keeping in mind, if there really is supposed to be some everlasting covenant and promise for the physical Jew, the, 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 the nation of Israel, and they need to have that land, and we're going to give them back their borders, and we're going to make Jerusalem the capital again, and we're going to recognize the Jew, and we're going to lift them up, and we're going to be blessed because we're blessing a Christ-rejecting nation. 
then why in the world does the Bible say in verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is no, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are heirs, we are inheritors of that promise that God made to Abraham. Amen. We are children of Abraham, his seed that's going to receive this everlasting promise. Not because we're physically born of Abraham, because it's never been about that. God has never been a respecter of persons like that, ever. He doesn't care. John the Baptist said, God is able of these stones to raise up seed unto Abraham. You think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, as if somehow that grants you your access into heaven. God doesn't care about that. He cares about the heart. He doesn't care if you've been circumcised the eighth day. He cares whether or not your heart has been circumcised. Turn if you go to Romans chapter 2. Where we'll see that very clearly again in Romans chapter 2. I'll reiterate the importance of knowing and reading and studying the Bible on your own because it's easy to go into a church and hear a preacher get up and only preach out of Genesis and try to teach you that this is why we need to bless Israel and this is why we need to lift them up and they have this promise and God made that promise to them and they're just going to have it and never turn to the New Testament. If you're not reading the Bible, you're going to be deceived. Right. You need to see these passages for yourself. So when you're sitting here, you go, wait a minute. I thought there is neither Jew nor Greek. I thought there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, male nor female. I thought it doesn't matter when we're all in Christ Jesus. Then why in the world does it matter if we have some other nation over here that doesn't accept Christ that we're supposed to be blessing? This doesn't add up. This doesn't make sense to me. You'll never know that if you're not reading the Bible on your own. Romans chapter 2. And really, we could read Romans 2, Romans 3, Romans 4, Romans 5, Romans 6, and you're going to see over and over and over again that it's not about the Jew. Right. It doesn't matter. Look at Romans 2, verse number 25. The Bible says, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So you're saying, you know what? Yeah, great. You want to be circumcised? Okay, then you're, then you're trusting in the law. Go ahead, keep the whole law. Oh, wait. You broke the law? <laughs> well, now your circumcision means nothing. Because now you're a transgressor of the law. Verse number 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law... Shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? So what he's saying is, if you have a person that's uncircumcised, but they're keeping the law, and they're being righteous, isn't that physical uncircumcision going to be counted as circumcision because they're keeping everything and they're living righteously? And that aren't they that end up judging you who is transgressing the law even though physically you've been circumcised? So they're more of a child of God than you are. Just because you've been circumcised in the flesh, they're actually doing it. They're actually living it. They're actually receiving God's commands and doing it. This is, this is the correlation he's making. This is the, the, the point he's trying to stress. About it's, it's not about that physical circumcision. Look at verse 28. For he is not a Jew. Again, very important verse. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly. So why do we care about outward Jews? Even if you believe that those people in the nation of Israel are Jews, which is a whole nother debate in and of itself, it doesn't even matter. Because does it really matter about being a Jew outwardly? He says, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. It's not what it's about. Verse 29, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter. I want the letter of the law, that physical circumcision. What it's always been about, what it really matters is the heart. 
The circumcision of the heart, being a Jew inwardly, one of God's people, one of God's chosen people in spirit. That's what it's all about. He doesn't care who you've descended from physically. You can't even choose that. There's nothing to do with anything. No, no, let me take that back. It, do, it does have something to do with something. The Bible says that, you know, what advantage of the Jew over Greek? It says much in every way, but chiefly because God gave the oracles to the Jews. He, 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 he used that nation to provide the word of God. So I correct myself. But nowadays, does it really matter at all? Not at all. In fact, I think it's probably more of a hindrance to be born a Jew today than anything else. In the past, yes, that was the nation that God was using to reveal His Word, to be the lighthouse under the world, to serve the Lord. But you know what? When God sent His only begotten Son unto them and they received Him not, that was a big turning point. And from that point forward, I, I don't think there is any advantage to being a Jew in generations afterwards. I think it'd be more of a curse than a blessing. Romans chapter 4. Flip over Romans chapter 4 real quick. Romans chapter 4, verse number 8. The Bible says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Basically, they're saying that Abraham believed God and he was justified before he was even circumcised. So he was in uncircumcision, yet he was justified. He had faith. He wasn't even... So, so you know, the, the, the circumcision was given as a token, as a seal, as a sign to symbolize the covenant that God made with him. It didn't make him saved. It wasn't necessary for him to be saved. He already was righteous. He already received his salvation. And his sins were not imputed unto him because he believed God, even when he was uncircumcised. Verse number 11 says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. He had the faith first. That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. That righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. And again, this is reiterating essentially what we see in Galatians chapter 3. It's the same, kind, the same material essentially is being worded slightly differently, but telling us it's not of the law, it's of faith, and that the promise would be made of none effect if it's through the law. Verse 15, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Of us all. You know, you know who this letter is written to? The Romans. This isn't written to the Jews. This isn't written to the Hebrews. This is written to the Romans. To the church. The people that believe in Rome. They believe on Jesus Christ. He says, Abraham is the father of us all. Because it's of faith. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Again, that reference to Abraham being a father of many nations has to do with him being the father of faith, has to do with him being the progenitor, ultimately, of Jesus Christ, who is going to provide salvation so that people of all walks, of all kindreds, of all tongues, of all nations can be saved. And that is the way that Abraham, through his faith, then is going to be able to um, become a father of faith, as it were, to, uh, to all nations that believe in Christ and therein be a father of many nations.
You can keep reading the rest of that passage. I don't, I don't want to keep going for this for sake of time. Turn, if you would, back to Joshua chapter 5, because there's one other, um, one other key point here I want to make. We see here then the, uh, and, I, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the sermon in Joshua 5, we're going to start reading here in verse number 8. The Bible says, And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. So obviously there is a recovery time, especially when you're older on, on, on the time it's going to take. It takes a few days to just be kind of more fully healed to be able to walk around again and, uh, and do things. And it says here in verse number 9, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. So the name was, was, Gilgal was given, just like the name Abraham was given to Abram, because he's going to be a father of many nations. This place now is called Gilgal, because this is finally when that reproach, I mean, it was a reproach being in Egypt. They were bond, bond servants. They were in slavery. They were reproached. They were, they were under bondage. And then they were brought in the wilderness, but they were still in their own bondage of sin, because they didn't fully put their faith in the Lord. So they're wandering about and they didn't really have a place to settle and they were kind of a reproach even to the people around them because God didn't end up fulfilling that promise yet that he had made to them. And they also didn't have their hearts circumcised to the Lord, which is why he made that generation die off. But now this circumcision in the flesh is the outward expression of the inward circumcision that's already taken place in their hearts. And now God's ready to use His people. Remember, we've, we've seen all through this book, just in the first few chapters, and He's talking about them, you know, getting ready, prepare yourself, sanctify yourself. The Lord's going to be with us. He's going to do great miracles, many mighty works. And He's using this group of people now that have their faith in the Lord. They're ready. We're ready to go. We're ready to receive the promised land, Lord. And their fathers weren't ready to do it, but this generation is ready to move forward and do it. They're circumcised in the heart. God says, all right, let's, let's show them this. We're going to, we're going to give you just finally get rid of that reproach of Egypt because now I have my people that are ready to move forward they get circumcised they're ready to go they're sanctified and now finally that reproach is rolled away he said that's taken off now we're done with that that's that portion of your life is over and now we're moving forward on to bigger and better things Look at verse number 10 the Bible says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And it's this amazing timing that God works out with everything. You think it's just a coincidence that they happen to be keeping the Passover now right before they're, they're going to attack their first city and just start inheriting the promised land? That that inheritance comes like the day after the symbolism of Jesus Christ being that Passover lamb is given? That they wandered around for those 40 years for that generation to die. That he brought them through and had them cross over Jordan. That he had them circumcised and let them recover and heal. That now all of a sudden it just becomes, hey, it's time to celebrate the Passover. It's time to, you know, this isn't a coincidence. There's no way this is a coincidence, and, this, and we're being told this because if you remember in the, in last week, there was just one verse in there in verse 19. It says, And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. So there's all these different things happening. They, they set up those rocks to be the, the symbolism of, of uh, God letting them cross through Jordan on dry land. They get circumcised. They rest for about three days. And then now it's the fourth day. Hey, it's Passover. Let's sacrifice the Passover land, lamb. And now we're going to be getting into the promised land. And then in verse number 11, it says, And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. 
Neither are the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. There, there's, I mean, there's literally too much to preach through on this passage. I'm trying to hit as much as I can. There's so much content here with everything happening the way it is, between the circumcision kind of being renewed, between the Passover, which I'm not even really hitting on, and then the manna ending on this day. I want you to turn, if you would, real quick to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. I just want to briefly cover a little bit about manna before we close the sermon tonight. I started making all these notes and I got pages and pages. I'm just like, okay, I just got to stop because <laughs> I've got like eight pages of notes. I got to scale this back a little bit and focus on what I want to focus on because there's so much here. So study this out for yourself. This is an amazing chapter. There's so many things going on because this is literally as they're going to start inheriting the promised land. So symbolically, there's a lot that goes into this. We are inheritors. What's happening here is all symbolic of what's going to happen spiritually with our spiritual inheritance, our heavenly home, and what we receive because we are inheritors, because we are heirs with faithful Abraham through Jesus Christ in receiving our inheritance. And the things that have ended here, they, they have the, the Passover is happening, the, like I said, the circumcision, and then now here also the manna ceases. And the manna was given to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt and has sustained them for 40 years in the wilderness when they had no means of, of feeding themselves or everything. God just miraculously took care of the children of Israel and every single day they woke up, God provided for them. God's provision was there miraculously using angels' food with manna just on the ground. Showing us many, many things. Well, one of the things is you wonder, you know, God, how am I supposed to follow you? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. What am I going to eat? How am I going to feed myself? How am I prayer? God, I don't think I could follow and do what you want me to do because I've got to worry about all these other things. God's saying, no, follow me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. <coughs> Just go where I tell you to go. I'll worry about providing for you. I know you have need of these things. I know you need to be clothed. I know you need to be fed. Every day you wake up, trust that God is going to provide for you. That's why the, the, the sample prayer that Jesus Christ gave, you know, we commonly refer to as the Lord's Prayer. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Because every day when you're praying to God, just, hey, God, just take care of me today. Lord, I'm looking to you. Help me out. Give me provision. And this is what God did. He did this with the children of Israel. They were wandering about in the wilderness. They didn't have all their land set up and they're cultivating crops and they didn't do any of that. And God knew that they weren't doing that because he wanted them to wander around. He said, no, now I want you to go here. No, wait, now I want you to go over here, camp over here. Now I want you to go over there, camp over there. He wouldn't even give them time to, to set up and get established like that. So because he's doing that, he said, well, I'll provide for you. Here's some manna. Eat that. Deuteronomy chapter 8, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So you're saying part of what was going on in those 40 years now, especially with that second generation, God's wanting to see. He's proving you. He's testing them. What's really in your heart? Are you going to listen to me? Are you going to obey? Or are you just going to go back to Egypt? Verse number three, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. It means he allowed them to hunger. They didn't have an easy time. They didn't have everything just given to them on a silver platter. Now, he provided for them, but he brought them through that wilderness. He allowed them to get hungry. Remember, they, they were traveling sometimes for days, and they didn't have any food. God allowed them to, to, to go through that a little bit. He allowed them to suffer a little bit because he wants to see what's in them. Important lessons, lots of important lessons. Don't forget, if you start going through some rough times in your life, don't just, don't just give up right away. Oh man, this stuff is, this is just too hard. I can't deal with this. I want to go back into just my worldly ways of living and not have to deal with these problems. You might just be te being tested by God. Because ultimately you have to know God will take care of you. You may go through some, some times where you, where you start getting a little hungry. Or you start getting real uncomfortable for other purposes. 
family members, whatever the case may be. Other things going on in your life. God might allow you to go through a lot of those things just to see, hey, are you really serious about this? Is going without a little bit of food for a day or two just going to make you just quit? Or are you going to see it through and stick to it and keep moving forward? Because you actually have a real faith that, that God will not leave you or forsake you. Verse number three, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. He said, no one knew what this stuff was. I just gave you manna. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. That's how they knew. Because God provided manna for him. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. Jump down to verse number 13. So it was miraculous. They just made it through this wilderness. They didn't have to buy new shoes. They didn't have to buy new clothes or make new clothes. God took care of them the whole time. And that, that's how he's saying, this is going to help you to learn you don't, you don't just need the physical things. That's actually, you know, that's not what you need. You just need to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. Every word. So if God's saying, go over here, you go over there. You don't need to worry about whether or not you're going to be taken care of. Because he's, you know, that manna is showing them, see, I'm providing for you. See, you're taken care of. Just do what I tell you to do. There it is. I mean, every day they woke up, they didn't know if it was going to be there unless they just trusted that God that it would be there. Because they weren't allowed to go and hoard it up. They couldn't go out that day and be like, oh, I'm just going to gather all this stuff and I'm going to stockpile it up and I'm going to have my vault and I'm going to have my prepper cabin all geared up and ready to go. And you know what? I'm set. Because it would breed worms and stink and not be good for the next day. Unless it was Friday. <laughs> Talk about a miracle. Any other day of the week, if you go and try to stock up that manna, it's going to breed worms. It's not going to keep. You cannot keep any of it. But you know what? If it's Friday, you can, you can, you can store it up. Because God didn't want you going out and working and gathering it on the Sabbath. He said, no, no, you rest. So that day, it, it, won't, it won't go bad. One more reason just to try, just, it doesn't even have to make sense. Just trust God. Because there's no way to explain that in any natural process whatsoever other than, well, it's a miracle of God. God had his hand in it. Verse number 13, again, <laughs> you, I, there's entire sermons that we preached on manna too. Uh, it's an amazing thing. There's so much packed in here. Look at verse number 13 here, Deuteronomy 8. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the flint of the rock who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end so verse 16 says he fed thee in the wilderness with manna it says no one knew it that he might humble them they needed to be brought low they needed to rely on God. They needed to be taught and to train. That was their training ground in the wilderness, to just rely on God. They, they had to learn to just fear the Lord, do what He says, and they'll make it through. That was a good training ground trial for them because they were going into a battle. They need to be ready to fight. They needed to be ready to stand firm. They need to be ready to not back down. They need to be ready that no matter what they faced, God's going to get them through it. So he brought them low. He says, nope, every single day, trust me, every single day, eat what I have to give you. Every single day, be humble. Learn how to live off of this. You don't get your choice of chicken and burgers and fries and shakes and everything. Oh, you're going to eat manna. It's good enough to get you through. This is what you need. Don't worry about anything else. Stay focused on what I have for you to do. And you get through that training ground. Now you're ready to fight. Now you're ready for the battles. Now you're ready for the victories. Now you're ready for the great things to happen. Many of you might feel like you're going through boot camp at different times in your life. 
Don't quit. Don't quit. That might just be the training ground. There's a lot more, a lot more exciting things to come, a lot more victories to come. You might feel low, feel like you're being defeated. The only, the only time you will be defeated is if you quit. Then you lost. But if you stay in it, there's a lot more to come. And, and, and this is what God has been teaching and training these people with. And that's why he says, I humbled you with the manna, and I needed to prove you. I wanted to test you. And he says, in order to do you good at the latter end. Because they, they already had the promise that God would do them good. But he's just testing them, putting them through it. Make sure, do you actually believe this? Let's go back to Joshua chapter 5. We're going to finish up here. Joshua chapter 5, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversary? So Joshua sees this guy. He's got his sword out, and he's going he's to see: Is this, you know, is this, is this one of the heathen? Is this, is this an enemy, or is this guy going to be on our side, right? So he asks him, "Say, are you for us or are you for our enemies?" I love this answer. He says, and he said, "Nay." He says, I don't accept your choices. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm for you or for them. He's saying, but as captain of the Lord of hosts, am I now come? He says, I'm for God. Not for you, Joshua. I'm not for them. But I stand here for the Lord. And see, Joshua accepts that. He says, Amen. Because Joshua says, I'm here for the Lord too. He says, Nay, as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face of the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? This is why Joshua was lifted up. This is why God allowed Joshua to be feared in the eyes of the people. Because it wasn't about Joshua. It's about him serving the Lord. Verse 15 says, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy, sho thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So Joshua received his command from the Lord. We'll get into that next week. What an awesome chapter. Go home and study this out. Like I said, there's too many things to really completely flesh out and get into, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, go and study this out. Hopefully it'll be pretty soon. I might be coming back to some of those issues a little bit later, but uh, let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all the great lessons that we can learn in your words, all the encouragement that we could receive, all the truth and wisdom that we can gain, dear Lord. I pray that you would please let these words to sink in. Help us not to be forgetful hearers, but doers of the work, dear Lord, that we can really uh, get these truths established in our hearts, that we could be mindful of these things, that we could increase our faith and trust in you even more and more, and just be confident and know that if you're with us, no one could be against us. So we have nothing to fear and that uh, you, we just want you to use us to do great things. We want to see some great victories, dear Lord, and, and use, use us or a group of, of weak people here, just, just fleshly vessels, dear Lord. And uh, we ask for you to, to use us. We've been trying to sanctify ourselves to be meat for your use. Help us to, to get as many souls saved as we possibly can with your guidance and direction, dear Lord. And help us to bring great honor and glory unto Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.